All I can say is, wow, wow, what a morning of music this has been. It has been phenomenal. Last night, we had the better part of two hours of a concert. They even did two and a half encores, <laughs> if you were here. <laughs> we had a phenomenal time, and it is a special, special treat to be able to have the King's Brass on a Sunday morning, and uh, that is a real, real blessing. I first met Tim in 1992. He came up to a little Baptist church up in the middle of Pennsylvania, and he did a concert for us there in a small auditorium, and I just uh, really appreciate these men. I appreciate the fact that they're willing to use their God-given talent for the Lord. Uh, how many of you played musical instruments or have uh, continued to whatever? Um, yes, I, I played a trumpet, had trumpet lessons for years, played in the orchestra and the band and all those kind of things. And when my mother finally told me it was time to quit, um, <laughs> I, I hung it up. And I'll tell you, not everyone has that spiritual gift that talent from the Lord, and to see these men up here uh, being able to perform like this and bless us like this is enormously significant. So I'm very, very thankful. But I met Tim, 1992. Uh, my point is he comes to little churches, he comes to bigger churches, and generally uh, bigger audiences on Sunday morning, and I'm just thrilled that he was willing to come and, and be with us here today. So uh, I trust that you've been blessed, and uh, you appreciate uh, just the, the uplifting songs that we were able to sing before the concert here this morning. It has really been a joy. And you can give, uh, let me just mention that there'll be people in the back with buckets that anything that goes into that bucket will go towards King's Brass as a love offering. I, I'm so impressed that King's Brass are willing to come for love offering. And uh, that is a real blessing. But we want to be generous, don't we? We want to be able to be generous and give uh, like we were at a concert, because we have been at a concert. And uh, I trust that uh, you can make the checks out to Faith Community Church, but put King's Brass in that memo section. And again, place it in the bucket. If you place it in the wooden boxes back there and put King's Brass, it'll also go to King's Brass, all right? Well, it has been phenomenal to have them here with us. Be in prayer for them. They travel right after the service, pretty much load up and hit the road. They've got a four o'clock uh, big concert up in Pennsylvania later on this afternoon. We were actually their first stop for the summer. What a great way to kick off our summer, huh? This has been fantastic. Well, this morning, if you'd take your Bibles for the few minutes that we have and turn to Luke chapter 15, Luke the 15th chapter this morning. What I'd like to do this morning is uh, to look at a parable of Scripture that uh, may be somewhat uh, familiar to us as we have had the opportunity. I'm in Luke chapter 15, and I'd like to read for you our text this morning, starting there in verse 8, uh, where it talks about the parable of the lost coin. And it says, Or what woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully under or, or until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you. We thank you for the music we've been enjoying here today and last night. We thank you, Father, for the word of God. We thank you for this parable. We pray, Lord, that you would cause our hearts to learn from it this morning as we take a close look at this immensely important message. Bless our hearts today, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I absolutely detest losing stuff. Don't you hate losing stuff? I remember uh, several years ago now, I remember my son and I got together and we decided that we were done losing stuff and we were going to start to find stuff because we figured everybody else in the world is losing stuff like us and why shouldn't we be the ones to find it? And so we decided, hey, we're going to go out and find stuff. Well, we did find a little bit of stuff here and there, but not very much. It seems like it's a whole lot easier to lose things. Well, the parable this morning is about a woman who lost a coin. She had 10 silver coins, but she lost one. And she sweeps her house looking for that coin. How many here have ever lost something and become very frustrated by the fact that you've lost it? Okay. What do we, you know, what do we typically lose? 
Our keys, right? Our car keys, it is always, always a problem. And if you know me, I always keep my car keys up here at the front of the church because I need my keys to get into my office. And uh, invariably, someone will pick up that set of keys and say, are these your keys, Pastor? I'm looking over there now, and I realize that my car keys are missing. (laughs) Do you know where they are, hon? She doesn't know where they are. Now, luckily for me... There's an app for this problem. (laughs) And so, ah, what do I hear? Someone has my keys. Just hold up your hand if you have my keys. There's no denying it. There they are. (laughs) Brother Glenn has my keys. You see, there's always a way if you really want to find stuff with the technology that's available to us today. But one of the frustrations is when you lose something, you come to this passage of Scripture and you see this woman who has lost one of her coins. Well, later on this afternoon, actually right after the service, I'll be leaving to head to the airport uh, for my overseas flight. And I'll be teaching hermeneutics to a group of pastors uh, that don't have access to uh, material and don't have access to education. But the textbook that I'll be using points out an illustration with regard to this lost coin. It says, for example, imagine yourself at a Bible study with a dozen other college students. It's your first time to this study and you're a bit uncomfortable. You're trying to make heads or tails. And they read this parable to you. And then you hear, so what do you think this passage means? What is God trying to teach us here? I don't know, it begins a girl with blonde hair wearing a Point of Grace t-shirt, but she says, my study Bible says the houses in those days had low roofs, few windows, and it was kind of hard to see in there, and that's why she needed a lamp. Jared, a guy you know from your English class, is sitting across from you, and uh, he pipes up and says, yeah, she has to sweep out the house because it's dirty. So we have a dark, dirty house with not much light. I think this is like the world, you know? I mean, when we drift back into the world, it's like being the coin, not able to see clearly, lost in the dark and in the dirt, and unable to see Jesus. So the house stands for the world. We're the coin when we backslide. Jesus is the one who comes and looks for us in the dark. Well, you think to yourself, Jared's making pretty good sense. He's a smart guy. You remember that from the English class, and you nod your head like you knew that all along. Jared, Jessica says, I never thought of the house as referring to the world. When I think of a dark place where people can get lost, I think of the church. I mean, just look at all the churches today that aren't really following Jesus and just preaching psychology and stuff, you know? It's like that church in the book of Revelation that Jesus says is lukewarm. The one he'll spit out of his mouth. The church really needs the light of the gospel today. And and remember that all those early churches were house churches, weren't they? I mean, they met in houses instead of churches like we do. So the house could be referring to the churches. It makes sense to me anyhow. But then Brian asks, what would the coin be? Well, responds Jessica, maybe the coin represents the true faithful congregations that seem to get lost in the middle of all these other churches who don't know what's going on. Oh, Okay. I never really thought about the house being churches, offers the Point of Grace t-shirt gal. If the house is dark and dirty, it's probably referring to our hearts. Isn't that what is dark and dirty in our lives? We try and try to follow Jesus, but we fail because our hearts are not clean. However, Jesus comes and cleans our hearts, and just like the woman in the story, he sweeps them out and forgives us of all of our sins. I like to think of Jesus as sweeping out my heart and making me clean. Isn't that neat? She smiles brightly and looks down at her Bible, and she says, look at this. My study Bible says the brooms they had in those days were made of numerous two-foot-long straws that were bundled together and tied at the top. Wow, you know, like the one straw can't do anything, but when they're bundled together, they're like really strong. So the broom is like the Bible. I mean, like Jesus sweeps out our hearts, right? And what does he use to clean us, cleans us, uh, clean us out? He says the Bible, right? So the Bible's composed of lots of individual books. There's 66 to be exact. And they're bound up together so that they'll be strong. And Jesus cleanses our hearts with the Bible. Well, isn't that awesome? So you're thinking to yourself, yeah, the Point of Grace teacher gal is pretty insightful into this stuff, and you wish you could see something spiritual and deep and profound. You look down at your Bible, but you can't come up with anything profoundly spiritual about the house or the woman or the coin, so you feel a little bit confused. Can the house really refer to all these things? Can it be the world? Can it be backslidden churches, also our hearts? Or maybe it just refers to a house. 
woman had to have somewhere to live. Should you just randomly choose one of these meanings? Well, I'll be teaching the men there how to determine what the biblical meaning of the text actually is. And what we would call that story that I just read was spiritualizing things. And you can come up with all types of implications. The problem is when we do that, we tend to miss the real meaning. And the real meaning here in this passage of Scripture is this lost coin. You see, the lost coin is a parable, but it's sandwiched in between two other parables. In fact, when you look at this carefully, you see that it is all one teaching that Jesus is bringing to bear. It begins there with the verse 3 and goes clear through the end of this chapter. Pick it up in verse 1, if you would, with me, and notice that all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him to listen to him. There's uh, an issue there, because when you think of these tax collectors and you think of sinners, think of the tax collector as being the lowest rung on the ladder. He is as low as you can go. He is despised by everyone in that citizenship. He is absolutely despised. And then there are these other sinners who are also with these tax collectors, and they're all sitting there listening to Jesus. And the question in the mind of the Pharisees and the scribes is, why are you allowing these people to come and listen? Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Jesus knows their heart and mind, doesn't he? And so Jesus turns to them and he starts with the first parable. And the first parable deals with a shepherd. He says, what man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? Now, in the mindset of the Jewish audience of the day, if you were back there in Luke chapter 15, you would know exactly what Jesus means. He tells them a very typical story, one that they could easily relate to. If you were a shepherd and you lost one of your sheep, you would leave the other sheep and go find the one. I'm not a shepherd. In fact, I have very few shepherd skills when it comes to sheep. <laughs> and you ask me, if I had a hundred sheep, I'd be thankful I had a hundred sheep, you know what I mean? And if one of them derelict sheep ran off, I'd be happy I have 99 sheep. <laughs> and I'm sure not going to leave the 99 sheep so that I can go fetch that one stupid sheep over there because as soon as I come back, I'll have 89 sheep. <laughs> that's the way I think. But that's not the way they thought when Jesus taught this parable. You see, commonly, the shepherd would leave that sheep and he would go and find the one. And the Bible says when he found it, has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing, such as the pictures or the artistry work, the carvings that we have in our homes. I have one made out of olive wood in my office with the shepherd with the sheep on his shoulders. And he says that when he comes home, he gets all of his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me for I have found my sheep which is lost. Here's Jesus' teaching point. He says, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. This was meant as a rebuke to the Pharisees and the scribes who thought themselves much more highly than they should think. They saw themselves as not needing repentance. They saw themselves as being clean before God. And so Jesus is trying to show them their hearts and show them their need. We go to the parable of the lost coin, and then the third parable in this passage is known today as the prodigal son. It should be much clearly marked as the lost son. 
because as we would look at this passage, we have lost sheep, we have lost coin, and when you come to verse 13, or verse 11 rather, it says, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, give me the share of my estate. You know the story. He takes off with all of these things. And so we see the, the lesser to the greater, it doesn't matter. What Jesus is comparing this to is the love that God has for individuals. You see, we can't miss the point here. There is a hallelujah when the one sheep is found. When the coin is found, there is rejoicing and the word goes out. And the same thing is true here with the lost son. For the Bible says that after he goes out and after he sins, you probably are very familiar with this story. He goes out and he sins. He spends all of his inheritance and he realizes he is at the bottom of the barrel looking up and the Bible says he goes back to his father and when his father was still a long way off from his father his father saw him felt compassion ran and embraced him and kissed him but notice what the son says when he meets his father face to face he says father I've sinned against heaven and in your sight I'm no longer worthy to be called your son my friends that is repentance isn't it in every situation, we have a value. When there were a hundred sheep and you lost one, the one was what percentage of the hundred? One. When the woman had 10 coins, 10 silver coins, and she lost one, it was what percentage of the overall? You're, some of you are a little sharper than the first crowd. They stumbled with that one. I helped them out. It's all right. And when you come to the math on this lost son, there is a father who has two sons and one is lost. What's the percentage there? 50%. From the least to the greatest, our God came to seek and to save that which is lost. Let's tie this all together here as we look at the conclusion here of Luke chapter 15. When the Bible says that the party began, and it was quite a party, the father said to his slaves, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet, get that fatted calf and kill it. Let's eat it. Let's celebrate. The son of mine was dead and now he's found. And they began to celebrate. And the Bible says that the older son who was out working came in and he could hear the sound of this celebration and he wanted to know what is going on. And when they told him that his brother had come home, that the father had killed the fatted calf and was celebrating, he became angry, the Bible says in verse 28, and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him, but he answered and he said to his father, look, for so many years I've been serving you and I have never neglected a command of yours. You can tie that passage, the end of it there in verses 28, 29, and so forth, back over there to verse 1 where the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. You see, the problem that they had was that they, the, the younger boy, when he came home and there was a celebration for him, his older brother detested that. I've kept all the commandments. I don't know why you're throwing a party for him. He's been around all of the sin and all of the shame. Why don't you throw a party for me? You see, Jesus, why are you making a big deal about the sinners and the, and the tax collectors? Why do you invite them in and why will you receive them? Receive us. We've obeyed the commands of God. We have a lost sheep and a lost coin and a lost son. And when those three items are found, there is rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who's repented. Now, the key point is and Jesus will expand on this, and the rest of the New Testament expands on it in great detail. But these Pharisees and scribes thought that they were righteous, when in fact they were not. For the Bible teaches us clearly there is none righteous, no, not even one. And you can do the math on that, that's 100%. Every single one of us is a sinner. The wages of our sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. My friends, 
God came to seek and to save that which was lost because he loves us. Because he wants a relationship with us. That's why the shepherd, unlike someone like me and maybe you, would, would, would leave the 99 and go look for the, the hundredth sheep. You see, God loves us and he wants that relationship with us. And so he is willing to pursue us. Maybe you've been that lost coin and you've been found. And there is rejoicing, and you rejoice over your testimony that you have in Christ salvation full and free. But you may be here today, and you may still be lost. But understand this. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, God is still pursuing you. God has sent his son to die on a cross in our place that we might come to him through faith and have salvation. Not in works that we've done, but according to his mercy. And why is he merciful? Because he loves us. Isn't it amazing how a perfect, holy, all-powerful God would love us so much that he would go to the degree he's gone to to pursue us so that he can have a relationship with us. That's what Jesus is teaching here in Luke 15. He's teaching very, very clearly the passion of the Lord for the sinner. Have your sins been forgiven? Are you sure that you're on your way to heaven? Would you bow your heads with me for just a moment, please? It may be that you're here this morning and God is speaking to your heart. You know in your heart that God is pursuing you. Maybe there's a conviction in your heart this morning. And you finally want to turn to the Lord and place your faith in Jesus Christ. If you've never done this and God's at work in your life, I invite you this morning to call upon his name. The Bible says, whoever calls upon his name shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from the consequence of our sin, which is an eternity without God. You're here this morning, you say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. God's at work in my heart. I know he's looking for me. Like the shepherd seeking that sheep, like the woman seeking the coin, like the father who runs out to his lost son, you recognize that God is inviting you. And you're here this morning, you say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me today, would you? God's working on my heart. I wanna be sure that I'm on my way to heaven. I wanna put my faith in Jesus Christ. Is there anyone at all? Just slip up your hand with our heads bowed. Nobody's looking around, but you slip up your hand, say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. God is working in my heart and life. Is there anyone? Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Would you all stand with me, please? We're gonna have a word of prayer. If you'd like to talk with someone more about the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have personal workers that'll be here at the front. They'd love to, to talk with you, maybe open the scriptures up, show you a couple verses that might be helpful, pray with you, whatever the need might be. Our God is a God who saves. And we can be so thankful for that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for giving to us just a phenomenal day. Thank you, Father, today for the work of Christ. We thank you, Father, for these parables that point out your desire to have a relationship with us, even though we're fallen people, even though we're sinners. You're willing to forgive us and by your grace extend to us eternal life through Jesus. Oh, Father, how I pray for these, Lord, who you're working in their hearts today. How wonderful it is to see the Spirit of the Lord working in the lives of people. Lord, may you finish that work. And may these who have indicated their desire for me to pray for them, may they truly find peace in knowing that their sins are forgiven. And may the joy of that, as we've seen from the Scriptures, Fill their heart, I pray. Give us just an awesome week, Lord, I pray. 
Bless all the things that we do. May we do it for your honor and for your glory. And bless the king's brass as they travel, as they go on their summer journeys, touring. Father, they've blessed our heart. How I pray that they would be a great blessing to others. We thank you and praise you for all of it. In Christ's name, amen.